If it's Friday, command and console. President Biden takes in a solemn moment when the bodies of three fallen U.S. service members return home as the world watches and waits for his administration's retaliation campaign to begin in the Middle East. Plus, breaking news out of Georgia, Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis says she should stay on the case against Donald Trump, despite confirming that she engaged in a romantic relationship with the special prosecutor she put in charge of prosecuting the former president. And the most important voices of 2024, the voters. Our NBC team is on the ground with a revealing look at black voters in South Carolina and diehard Trump supporters on the trail. Two very different but very significant groups in the race for the White House. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington. As we come on the air, we want to note that in recent minutes, there have been reports of bombardments in eastern Syria. Now, it comes amid anticipation of the U.S.'s military response in the region in retaliation for the drone strikes that killed U.S. service members. But a senior U.S. official tells NBC News, quote, whatever is happening is not us. And the Pentagon cannot confirm reports of military strikes. Now, we are obviously keeping a close eye on these reports. We will bring you any new information as we get it. It does come as President Biden today carried out one of his most solemn duties as commander in chief, attending the dignified transfer of those three U.S. soldiers killed in Jordan earlier this week. Let's take a look at their names. They're Sergeant William Rivers, Sergeant Kennedy Sanders, Sergeant Brianna Moffat Sanders and Mo Sanders and Moffat both receiving posthumous promotions in the wake of the tragedy. Now you can see the president here with his hand over his heart as senior officers of the army carry the transfer cases, each draped with an American flag, out of the aircrafts as they make their way back to the U.S. and to their final resting places. This is the second dignified transfer President Biden has attended since taking office. Yesterday, while speaking at the National Prayer Breakfast, the president continued to honor the service and sacrifice of the fallen troops. Our prayers continue to be with the families of the three American servicemen killed and attacked in the FOB in Jordan. They risked it all and will never forget the sacrifices and service to our country that the dozens of service members who were wounded and are recovering now. The White House has blamed that deadly attack on the Islamic resistance in Iraq, an umbrella group of Iran-backed militias, and it comes as the administration readies its response, which will likely include both military strikes and cyber operations, according to sources. The administration, of course, trying to balance a strong response that will hold those groups accountable while also trying to avoid a wider war. I think everyone recognizes uh, the, the challenge associated with making sure that we hold the right people accountable, uh, that, uh, that we do everything necessary to protect our troops, and that we manage things so that it, they, they don't escalate. There are ways to, uh, to, to manage this so it doesn't spiral out of control, and that's been our focus uh, throughout. I don't think the, uh, the adversaries are of a one-and-done mindset, uh, and so... Uh, they have a lot of capability. I have a lot more. As speculation mounts about what the U.S. response will look like, Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi, telegraphed a warning of his own. In a televised address, he said, quote, we will not start any war, but if anyone wants to bully us, they will receive a strong response. Joining me now is our team of reporters, NBC News chief international correspondent Keir Simmons is in Iraq. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is in Tel Aviv. And NBC News correspondent Aaron Gilchrist is outside Dover Air Force Base, where the president was this afternoon. Kira, I have to start with you. What do we know about what exactly is happening inside eastern Syria right now? Well, Kristen, something happened in eastern Syria. There were multiple reports, as you mentioned right at the top of the show there. Uh, our understanding uh, from the U.S. government is that uh, this is not uh, a U.S., the beginning of those uh, much uh, expected U.S. airstrikes. Uh, that area of uh, eastern Syria 
focused on a place called Meadin, which is where there is an encampment, well known actually, of Iranian-backed militia, and it is a strip that runs down to the border with Iraq here, where there is also a substantial installation, uh, Iranian installation, that has been targeted before. So it's understandable that as these reports began to come out, uh, people were wondering, questioning whether this was the beginning of the uh, US campaign. It does not appear to be the case. So frankly, as we talk right now, Kristen, what happened there uh, isn't entirely clear, but it does point to that we have some idea, perhaps, perhaps, of what this campaign will look like when it does start. I mean, there are many, many potential targets across Syria and, and here in Iraq, and, and that really just points to the, to the reality that I Iran and its proxies have, well, you could almost say taken over, particularly in Syria and, and to some extent here in, in Iraq, in recent years, uh, and have pushed their way through Syria towards uh, the border with, with Israel, even. Uh, you know, I think that potentially we could see strikes around Damascus Airport, where we have seen strikes uh, before, particularly by the uh, Israelis. Perhaps Aleppo Airport, again, uh, a place that is used by Iran and by its proxies. Uh, there are encampments and bases around there. Uh, and we may also see a uh, targeting of uh, the Syrian... Uh, military industrial complex, uh, which is very much uh, integrated uh, with uh, Iranian, uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, and Iranian support. So, so we have an idea, but of course uh, the US has much deeper intelligence th th than we would have, and so you know, it may be that there are other places that will be targeted, or, or alternative places that are targeted, uh, that we don't know about. And it may be that we also see individuals uh, targeted, maybe members of that Ooh. Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, we, will, we will see, and as we speak right now, Kristen, we don't know when this will get underway. And the big question, of course, Kira, is what will the response be if and when these retaliatory strikes do get underway? I discussed that warning from Iran's president. What has the response been there in Iraq and throughout the broader region to that warning by Tehran. Well, I think that's to be expected. I mean, I think that's the kind of signaling you'd expect from Iran. I think another interesting uh, message, piece of messaging, if you like, uh, was from another group that's part of this umbrella group, uh, the Islamic resistance in Iraq, uh, accused of carrying out that attack that killed those uh, three uh, US service members. Now, this particular group declared today that they will continue whatever with their campaign to drive the US out of Iraq and to try to push for an end to the war in Gaza. That was a completely different message to another faction in that same group this week who said that they would stop their, um, their attacks. And, and that tells you a few things, I think. Uh, one is that actually the reality is for the Biden administration to try to shift the strategy of Iran and its proxies to pre put pressure on Israel, to push the uh, US out of this region, that is an enormously difficult thing to achieve when the, both Israel and the US have carried out airstrikes uh, through the last 10 years, uh, particularly in Syria, and they haven't moved that particular needle. So there's that aspect. Another thing it tells you too, though, is I do think that there is a certain lack of organization among these proxy groups. Certainly. Uh, the Defence Secretary saying that they are, they are uh, sponsored by Iran, but within that, that, I think there is some infighting, perhaps, some confusion. So that's the kind of picture that you're, you're dealing with here. And it is very, very difficult for the Biden administration. Just to finish, Kristen, one, and I've said it a few times today, one just example of that is here in Iraq. Iraq is a partner of both the US and of Iran. And if you come in too strongly here in Iraq, for example, you risk, if you're the Biden administration, pushing the Iraqi government more mm. towards Iran, uh, helping those voices that say that uh, the US should be pushed out of Iraq, which is, of course, exactly Iran's strategy. Yeah, that complicated backdrop is so important to these developments that we are tracking there. Kier, thank you for your fantastic reporting. Matt Bradley, I want to go to you in Tel Aviv. Uh, again, the world is watching and waiting to see when, if at any time, these retaliatory strikes might begin, how robust they might be. What is the latest from your vantage point that you're seeing? 
Yeah, well, we're not hearing much from the uh, Israeli government at all about this. They are not commenting, and nor would we expect them to. Uh, for them, you know, this is kind of a, you know, taking a step back. They're not going to meddle in uh, the U.S.'s affairs, but we can bet that they're going to be moving things behind the scenes. Um, for the Israelis and others in the Middle East, you know, this is part of what they have been saying for decades, especially this is kind of what Netanyahu's line has been for quite a long time, that Iran is the principal enemy in the region. And he can point to uh, Iran's cat's paws throughout the region, particularly Hamas, which is now uh, part of the, the, on the sharp end of Israel's sustained now 15-week war in the Gaza Strip that's now killed nearly 27,000 people, most of them civilians. This, according to the Gazan Ministry of Health. And there's also to the north, there's Hezbollah, and then there's the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, then there's also where Kir is, all of these Iran-backed groups in Iraq and Syria. And added to that, this so-called axis of resistance that Israel has been talking about, specifically Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, has been talking about for the better part of, of his entire uh, you know, tenure, both now and in the 1990s, uh, the threat that Iran poses with their proxy groups. Now, from what I understand from speaking with analysts about this, when I was in Lebanon at the outset of this crisis, Yes, these are proxies, but they are not puppets, to what Kier was saying. This is not necessarily a collection of different groups, this axis of resistance, that while they benefit from Tehran's largesse, they don't necessarily do their bidding completely. And so that is why you might be seeing some disjointed moves uh, amongst them. Uh, they're not necessarily coordinated because they don't necessarily speak so closely or coordinate so closely amongst each other. But this is the first time in history, in the history of this so-called uh, axis of resistance, that we're seeing each of them operating in concert with each other. There's never been a time when we've seen all of them firing all of their pistons all at once, even if they're not coordinating amongst each other. And I should add, amongst that group of the axis of resistance, a lot of people would also include Bashar al-Assad's mm. Syria, a government that also acts sort of in thrall of the Iranian regime. So there really are quite a lot of nodes of conflict and points of attack that can come into play now and in the coming weeks. Chris. All right. Matt Bradley, thank you so much. Please continue to update us on anything that you are hearing. We really appreciate your reporting. Aaron Gilchrist, I wanna head over to you. Obviously you're there at Dover Air Force Base where the president was there for the dignified transfer one of the most solemn duties of a U.S. president. Talk about the events today that unfolded there. Well, Kristen, this was a dignified transfer that was exactly what the, the name describes. We saw a very simple, solemn military ritual play out here on the tarmac at Dover Air Force Base. As you noted, President Biden, along with the First Lady, the Secretary of Defense, and several other uh, officials from the Defense Department and from Congress, for that matter, were here with the three families that are most impacted by what happened in that attack in uh, Jordan last weekend. You're seeing on your screen now one of the transfer cases that was removed from the aircraft this afternoon and placed in a, a van that's, that was waiting. All three of the transfer cases of the three sergeants who died last weekend were given the same treatment carried by this carry team of Army soldiers. The uh, people who died were all Army, and so they were uh, moved by Army soldiers uh, with the president looking on. The commander-in-chief watching uh, after having spoken with the families of these soldiers here at Dover Air Force Base today. He spent about an hour or so with them along with the First Lady. I would imagine uh, talking about wanting to learn about who these soldiers were and, of course, expressing the, his condolences and the gratitude of the nation, the weight that is on the commander-in-chief, any president, at a moment like this when he has to look the families in the eye and talk about the sending their loved ones into harm to harm's way. At the same time, the president knows that he has given the green light on retaliatory actions to happen uh, overseas, and, uh, and we await, Kristen, to see exactly when that, uh, that happens. All right, Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much for that reporting. Keir Simmons beforehand and Matt Bradley, we really appreciate it. I now want to bring in Ambassador John Bolton, former National Security Advisor to President Trump. Ambassador Bolton, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I should caution that this is 
a fast-moving situation. I am getting uh, in my ear that the United States has begun launching retaliatory strikes. Again, as we sit here right now, the retaliatory strikes have begun. Uh, we will get more information and I can get a more specific reaction. What is your reaction, though, Ambassador, to learning this? What would the U.S. need to do in order for these strikes to be effective? Well, I think what's happening in Syria right now could well be Israeli strikes because they've been striking Iranian convoys headed to Hezbollah and Lebanon for, for over 15 years. That There's nothing new in that sense. Uh, the American strikes, I think what we have heard from administration officials this week, are going to be uh, confined to Syria and Iraq and not Iran. I think that's a mistake. All right. Ambassador John Bolton, I'm going to ask you to stand by because we are going to go to a special report. Lester Holt will be anchoring that special report, which will begin momentarily. We appreciate it. Please stand by. Again, please stay tuned for a special report on the U.S. retaliatory strikes that have gotten underway in the Middle East. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good day, everyone. We're coming on the air with breaking news. U.S. officials confirm that the U.S. has begun retaliatory strikes in the Middle East in response to the deadly attack that killed three American troops. The strikes come days after those service members were killed in a drone attack on a U.S. outpost in Jordan last weekend, marking the first American deaths since the Israel-Hamas war began. Dozens of other troops were also injured in the attack as well. Today's news also comes hours after President Biden performed one of the most solemn duties of the presidency today, attending the dignified transfer of the fallen troops at Dover Air Force Base, honoring them before they are laid to rest. Our chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, is on the ground right now in Iraq. What do we know at this hour, Keir? Well, Esther, U.S. officials telling NBC News that retaliatory strikes have begun against Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and Syria. This is from U.S. government sources. It's not an official announcement by the U.S. government, as I understand it, as I speak to you right now, uh, Lester. We did have, though, news, I guess, about uh, 30 minutes ago uh, that there was something happening in eastern uh, Syria, uh, along the border, near the border with I Iraq, a, a place called Mayadin, which is uh, part of a, a strip that we know includes uh, encampments by four uh, Iranian-backed militias, and also in that same area, a well-known Iranian uh, base, uh, frankly, run by the Iranians. So. Uh, whether that is connected to what we are hearing now from uh, these uh, U.S. government sources, hard to tell. Uh, we will have to wait for more news because it is both Syria and Iraq that we're being told that these strikes have begun. But, of course, Lester, uh, this is what we have been expecting uh, for uh, days now. And we've got some kind of a picture of where the strikes may be. Uh, there are, frankly, multiple places that the Biden administration could choose to uh, target uh, tonight uh, across uh, Syria and Iraq. And then also very, very difficult judgments, Lester, for the Biden administration about how to do this in a way that sends a clear message to Tehran without overshooting, if you like, and causing a reaction from Tehran that, that escalates things towards a wider war. That is what the Biden administration has said again and again. It is very, very eager to try to avoid, uh, but at the same time, it clearly wants to send a message to Iran tonight about the killing of these uh, three American uh, military. All right, Keir Simmons in Iraq. I'll ask you to stand by as I bring in our senior White House correspondent, Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, as Keir had noted, we've been expecting something like this. Any signals, though, coming out of the White House today, or has it been business as usual by appearances? Well, we certainly had an expectation that this was a window of timing when this multi-tiered campaign of response could begin. Right now, the president is at his residence in Wilmington, Delaware, where he has a full uh, skiff, a secure compartment in his home where he can have uh, direct communications with the Pentagon and with any apparatus of the U.S. government. So he has full communications. He was in Delaware today in part because of the dignified transfer <laughs> 
that is, of course, the impetus for this whole new operation. The lives of three Americans, soldiers based in Georgia who were taken in that drone strike, a few dozen other Americans also injured at that time, and the decision made to ramp up response. There has been an ongoing campaign of allied forces, the U.S. and the U.K. and others, who have been attacking Houthi targets in the region, trying to prevent any interruption of commerce and those things. So there's been a lot of military activity in the region, but this is distinctly different. A U.S. alone planned operation. The president had said he'd been briefed on a number of options and he had made a decision. And then we learned from senior officials that there would be uh, an opportunity to consider a range of topics. And in these kinds of situations, assessing different uh, types of targets in multiple countries, assets that could be on the ground, on the water, or in the cyber realm, all potential things that could be within the president's uh, field of choice. Some of that comes from when the president makes a decision, and then some of it is executed at a military level where the president does not have to weigh in on each iteration of the operation. So. At what phase we're in right now, of course, this is the early going. What we don't know is if there have been less visible pieces of this kind of response, meaning the cyber realm, as well as, of course, the more obvious military targets. We will expect that the White House will comment at some point. So far, they're deferring to the Department of Defense. Lester? Yeah, and on that, just to clarify, is there any expectation the president himself would come out? We always are poised for that. I would expect a paper statement would be more likely at this point. And then at a later point when there's an assessment of how the operations have gone, a sense of perhaps is this a midpoint, a conclusion. Hard to know where we are other than we're at the beginning of this specific response. It is entirely possible the president would want to articulate this more. He has said he holds Iran indirectly responsible, but also has been careful to say he's not seeking a wider war, and the actions that he's taking are intended to show strength, but restraint to not prompt something that could go uh, and expand this beyond where the president is prepared for. But he wants to send a message with what's underway right now. All Lester? Right. Kelly O'Donnell asks you to stand by as well. Let me bring in Meet the Press moderator Kristen Welker. Uh, Kristen, the president has been under a lot of pressure uh, to do something, to make a stronger statement, but he's walking a, a really tightrope here in terms of the reaction, the spillover, the potential for a wider war. Lester, you're absolutely right. The president has been under immense pressure to respond. Remember, there have been more than 100 attacks against U.S. targets throughout the region. But this loss of life obviously required a stronger response. That is what we are now seeing unfold. And administration officials telling us this could last several days, if not weeks. The challenge for President Biden is what should this response specifically look like? You heard Kelly talk about the constellation of options that could be included in this response, including potentially a cyber component to this as well. This comes at a very delicate time in the region. In part, remember, there are talks underway right now aimed at trying to halt the fighting, aimed at trying to get the remaining hostages released. And there is that concern about the possibility for a wider war. There is some belief that a wider war has already started. And remember, this comes as the president of Iran has issued this stern warning that there would be retaliation for these strikes. So uh, the president walking a fine line. This, of course, comes against the backdrop of his reelection campaign. He's gotten low marks on his handling of this crisis so far in the Middle East. So a lot of scrutiny on this response right now, Lester. How long will it last? How robust will it be? Those are among the key questions we're watching. Kristen Welker, thank you. Let me bring in Admiral James Stavridis. He's a former Supreme Allied Commander at NATO and the NBC News Chief International Analyst. Uh, Admiral, let me ask you about the potential targets and, and what would make sense and what might have been already assumed or guessed by those that they're trying to attack. Well, Lester, we're going to see, I think, uh, a kind of a an, an move up the ladder of escalation here. As, as you and I have talked about for a couple of months now, these responses have been very proportional, meaning a drone hit a U.S. base, we fired back with a couple of uh, bombs or tomahawks. I think what is happening now, 
given the fact that we've had these uh, three servicemen and women killed tragically in Jordan last week, now you're going to see the next level. So what would that target set look like? I think it will go after, first and foremost, uh, the bases from which these Iranian um, missiles and drones have been operating. We know largely where those are. And instead of being just one or two Tomahawk missiles, a few bombs here and there, look for a pretty sustained campaign. Uh, that doesn't mean a wider war, but it means this is going to go on for several days, if not a week, if not two weeks. So the principal target sets will be the ammunition, the fuel, the command and control nodes, the transportation grids, the uh, above all, the, the drones and missiles themselves, all of those very legitimate targets. Now, here's what's interesting, Lester. As we get higher on that ladder of vertical escalation, I think you go after Iranian targets, but let me be very clear, not inside Iran, not Iranian missile facilities inside Iran, not overhead Tehran. Instead, what you're looking at is going after the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, IRGC, who are training, equipping, organizing, providing logistics, and probably directing these militias. So I think what you're going to see, and we should expect to hear from the Pentagon soon with some, some additional detail, not only are we going after the actual proxy groups, not only are we increasing the volume of strikes, but we are also going to include in our targeting Iranian Revolutionary Guard trainers who are supporting these. That's how you get right. at the hand of Iran. Yeah, and, and Admiral, let me ask you, will these be manned aircraft? Will this be escalated to the extent that these are airmen and women who will be flying over targets in harm's way as opposed to just tomahawks or perhaps drones? I would anticipate all three um, because from a volume perspective, as you get up into more of a campaign kind of days and potentially a week or even two weeks, really tomahawks won't get that done for you. You've got to have those jets coming off the aircraft carriers coming out of our bases in the Gulf who have the ability to carry multiple uh, joint direct munitions, JDAMs, they're called, you're well aware, these very precise bombs. But the volume you're going to need here, I think, is going to drive you toward a manned aircraft. In addition, by the way, Lester, to drones, correct, uh, Tomahawks, cruise missiles, also air launch cruise missiles, and then finally, as you say, manned aircraft delivering uh, bombs. I think we're going to see all of that, and there probably is some level of cyber attack going on as well in order to blind the sensors of these uh, proxy groups in their bases. It'll be all the above. Admiral, thank you. Let me bring our chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, back into the conversation. Keir, what reaction are you hearing from inside Iraq? Well, I think uh, Iraq uh, has been bracing itself for this. In Syria, they will have been uh, doing the same. I, I think just when you're hearing that uh, account of potentially the breadth of these strikes, and we don't know yet, uh, Lester, I, I think there'll be some reflection in that of the breadth of how Iran is... Uh, connected here in so many parts of this region at this part this at this time and that's been happening for a number of years and then just today uh, after president raisi of iran made that statement promising a response we had a defiant statement from one of the factions in the Islamic resistance uh, in Iraq uh, and saying today that it will, no matter what the U.S. does, continue with its campaign to try to push the U.S. out of this region and to put pressure on Israel and it says uh, aiming to try to uh, put an end to the war uh, in Gaza. So I think that just underscores the, the challenge for the Biden administration uh, with these strikes to try to send a strong enough message to Tehran to Tehran uh, that potentially shifts 
its strategy. Uh, the signals have been today uh, by these uh, Iranian-backed militia here in Iraq that they do not intend to shift their strategy, just as the Houthis have been saying the same thing uh, in Yemen. It is very, very difficult uh, to get this right for the Biden administration. All right, Keir Simmons, thank you for your reporting. Uh, again, if you're just tuning in, the U.S. has begun retaliatory strikes uh, against targets, unspecified targets right now within the Middle East. Uh, we are continuing to get information in. But again, this is uh, in line with what we've been expecting since the deaths of three American soldiers in Jordan at the hands of uh, Iran-backed militants last Sunday. So we'll continue to follow it. That concludes this NBC News special report. Much more ahead on our streaming network, NBC News Now, online at NBCNews.com. And tonight, when I see you here for Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt in New York. Thank you for watching. And welcome back to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington as we continue to follow that breaking news. The U.S. launching its first retaliatory strikes in response to the drone attack by Iran-backed militants that killed three U.S. service members and injured more than 40 others in Jordan. Now, according to U.S. officials, the strikes are being carried out in Iraq and Syria. Joining me now is retired four-star General Joseph Votel, former commander of U.S. Central Command. General, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Your response to these retaliatory strikes, I know they are just getting underway, but what is your anticipation? Well, thanks. It, it, uh, it's great to be with you. So I think what first and foremost, I guess, we just have to be patient and see what uh, exactly has been targeted here. It sounds like uh, some of the initial strikes here have taken place in eastern Syria, which is not surprising to me. This is a location where uh, these militant groups would operate, where you would see the presence of potentially IRGC Quds Force advisors or leaders operating in that area. So it doesn't surprise me that the first uh, the first strikes are uh, would be in that area against those who uh, would be most directly responsible for this attack on Tower 22. Uh, again, I think we have to be patient and see how this develops over the next uh, coming hours and and probably days here as we, as the United States and its and its partners uh, continue this this campaign to punish and, uh, and reestablish uh, some amount of deterrence in the region. It is our understanding that this will last days, if not weeks. What do you think needs to happen in order for this to be an effective retaliatory campaign, but also walk that fine line of not having this become a wider war? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, I think there's two things that have to happen. One, we have to punish those who are responsible for this attack that resulted in the deaths of our soldiers and the injuries to so many. And that's the first first thing, and that's probably what the early targets are really focused on. Then we also have to send an unambiguous message to Iran that we hold them completely responsible for uh, for this. Uh, their their proclamations that they don't control this are are unbelievable in my view. Uh, they have orchestrated this uh, this network for decades now. They are completely responsible. So the targets that we go after. Uh, must be those that are uh, of value to Iran and, and the loss of which will cause them to have some effect. That doesn't necessarily mean those need to be in Iran themselves, uh, but they need to be of significance and they need to be of importance enough to send a very clear message to, to Iran. And all this has to be followed up with very strong diplomatic messaging and economic uh, activities and uh, and activities in the information space here to tie all of our, all of these different tools we have together to create the biggest impact and and try to send the strongest message we can to Iran and to the region and of course as we've been reporting throughout the day not surprisingly Iran has issued a stern warning saying that they would respond if there were these types of retaliatory strikes what do you make of that? Again, not a surprise. You'd expect that type of rhetoric. But do you think that Iran will take some countermeasures? 
Well, it, I think it's possible, and I think we always have to be on guard for that. I mean, there is risk in everything we're doing here, and I think that's important for people to to appreciate. And I think that's why we see the administration approaching this in such a deliberate uh, deliberate manner. This is this is uh, a high level of complexity here uh, that uh, that we're dealing with, and it's likely that there is going to be a response. So the administration, the Pentagon, CENTCOM certainly have to build that into their calculations and into their plans uh, with the expected of that. We saw, we've seen uh, Iran in the past launch missiles against our bases and do other things in response to uh, actions that we have taken against them. Um, so we have to be prepared for that. And uh, and so we'll have to, we'll have to be on the watch uh, for that. But they've got, they've got tools as well, uh, whether it's ballistic missiles or uh, their, their big network that they've built across the region that can touch us in a variety of different ways. So we will have to be on guard uh, in the days and weeks ahead here. And General Votel, as we're having this conversation, Syrian State TV says that there mm. are a number of casualties. Uh, NBC News has not confirmed that. Again, that is coming from Syrian State TV. Um, what will you be watching for as we brace for these retaliatory strikes, which seem to have just gotten underway and are a part of, again, a broader campaign that we anticipate will last at least several days. Yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll be trying to pay attention to the sequence of targets that uh, the United States and its partners are going after. What are, what are we going after? Are we going after militia? Are we doing things that are more related to uh, to Iran? Or how, how are we addressing the totality of this this threat network that's responsible for the deaths of our of our soldiers and this continued threat that we've been operating under now for several months? So I'll be looking at that, and of course we'll be looking at the response of from Iran and from the Iranian threat network. Uh, the Houthis, the uh, uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, and the variety of other uh, Iranian-supported militia groups that operate in both Iraq and Syria. So I'll have to pay attention to that. And then the third thing is we'll have to pay attention to what the regional partners are doing. Um, they, they have been sitting back a little bit on this, and uh, it will be important for them to come forward in their diplomatic statements and other things that they're doing, uh, hopefully in support of, uh, of the actions that we are taking uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. And, uh, and of course, we'll watch what happens over in the Gaza area. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's most central Absolutely. to all of this. Uh, and we'll see if this if this distraction, these attacks over here, uh, lead to any type of uh, response from Lebanese Hezbollah or or other groups that could pose a threat to to Israel and, and exacerbate that situation. And General, just finally, before I let you go, obviously, as we've discussed, these strikes are getting underway against the backdrop of those very delicate and critical diplomatic talks, trying to broker a ceasefire in exchange for the release of the remaining hostages. I know that there's reporting that President Biden was quite concerned that these retaliatory strikes could in some ways impact or undermine those talks. What is your level of concern that what is unfolding right now could do just that? Well, I, I, th I think this this just underscores what we just talked about. I mean, this is the complexity of the whole situation. So obviously, I think, uh, you know, our government doesn't want to do anything that upsets that. We want the hostages to come back to their families as soon as we can. So I, I would imagine that has all been taken into calculation uh, in this and that probably is reflected in the in the strikes that are occurring today and will occur over in the coming days uh, with this. But, uh, you know, I, I think we will continue to stay engaged and play our role in that and work with all of the partners to try to try to resolve that. I actually think there can be some differentiation uh, established between these two different activities that are taking place in relative close proximity to each other. I think it's important to try to keep some distance between that uh, and certainly not do something that that, uh, that upsets, you know, trying to bring hostages home and trying to bring some cessation to what is really the origin problem here, which is the is the conflict in Gaza right now. Uh, that is that's what's leading to all of this uptick of violence across the region. All right, General Votel, thank you so very much for your insights and for joining us. We really appreciate Great to be it. With you. I want to bring back Ambassador John Bolton, former National Security Advisor to former President Trump. Ambassador, thank you for staying here for these breaking developments. Um, as you and I started our conversation, these retaliatory strikes began. Let me ask you, 
what you make of what we have seen so far and what you're going to be watching for in the coming days? Well, I think we've heard from administration sources they will be going after the Shia militia operations in Iraq and Syria and possibly after Iranian bases and facilities there as well. One question, having waited five days to start this, is how many of those bases are still going to be manned with uh, either the militia or Iranian forces. I think this strike is the right thing to do, but I think it comes far too late. There have been over 160 militia strikes against U.S. military and civilian personnel in Iraq since Hamas attacked on October the 7th. Uh, I think it was a mistake to leave our people vulnerable, uh, and I hope this is the beginning of a correction. But as I said a moment ago, I don't think the administration is signaling it's going to attack uh, Iranian assets inside Iran, and I think that's a mistake. I think Iran believes we are weak, that we are irresolute, uh, and that we're looking for an excuse to get out of the Middle East anyway. What would that look like specifically if the administration were to attack Iranian targets inside Iran? Would that not then become a wider war? And I know that you think to some effect this already has become a wider war, right? The wider war began on October the 7th. Mm -hmm. Hamas didn't wake up on its own one fine morning and decide to attack Israel. This is part of the Iranian ring of fire strategy. I agree with uh, what I think General Votel said, which is Iran is completely responsible for this. And if you don't grasp that point, then you're not going to have an effective response. Uh, I think that that uh, the sorts of things you could go after inside Iran as a first step are things like the military bases, Quds Force bases in western Iran that have been used for 15 years to train these Shia militia, equip them, and send them in, uh, particularly during the heavy presence of Americans there, killing over a couple hundred. You could attack Iranian air defense positions uh, in that same part of Iran and along the Gulf. Uh, you don't have to, at this point, attack oil infrastructure, the nuclear program, the ballistic missile program, or regime command and control. That can come later. But the signal that Iran needs to hear is uh, they've set a red line against attacking in Iran. We need to cross it. Well, and let me ask you, take me to my next question, because we, we the United States is taking this action on the heels of Iran's president issuing that very stern warning that we are going to retaliate. Not a surprise, obviously, that's what the U.S. would anticipate. But what should the United States be bracing for? And, and how should the Biden administration make sure that U.S. forces in the region are prepared to deal with such a response? Yeah, well, to start, of course, they crossed our red line. Yeah. They killed Americans. That, that's where this starts. Uh, the, the, the issue is not uh, what satisfies Iran. The issue is what helps get us to peace and security in the region. And the fact is, unless we strike disproportionately against Iran, uh, they, they, they have no incentive to retire. They have paid, since October the 7th, no cost for all of the hostilities in the region. And yet, they are the source and the rationale behind the hostility. So until they pay a cost, uh, you can count on it continuing. Um, Ambassador Bolton, let me read you this new information. This is just coming in right now. It's from the U.S. Central Command. It gives us a little bit more uh, detail about what has just unfolded. U.S. military forces struck more than 85 targets with numerous aircraft to include long-range bombers flown from the United States. The airstrikes employed more than 125 precision munitions. The facilities that were struck included command and control operations operations, centers, intelligence centers, rockets and missiles, and unmanned aired vehicle storages and logistics and munition supply chain facilities of militia groups and their IRGC sponsors who facilitated attacks against U.S. and coalition forces. Now we have a little bit more detail about how robust this attack was. What do you make of this first move in what we are anticipating will be a days-long campaign? Well, I mean, I think it sounds like they're off uh, to the right start, but let's also be clear, Iraq had to expect this was coming. And what sites, what damage was actually done at the, at the sites they're attacked, we'll have to assess. Uh, I'm not in any way critical of what they're doing so far. I think from a political point of view, the risk is that the signal uh, won't be clear. Okay, let me bring in uh, Andrea Mitchell, who is, of course, our chief Washington correspondent. 
Andrea, you are also our chief foreign affairs correspondent as well. Uh, weigh in here on your latest reporting about what is underway. And I'm obviously sitting here with Ambassador Bolton sure. uh, discussing the risks and what could unfold in the coming days. Well, this is a fairly strong initial step. It's only the initial step. As you recall, Secretary Austin said yesterday this would be multi-tiered. Uh, I think, as Admiral Stavridis was saying earlier, this is going to include cyber. It's going to be kinetic. It is kinetic here. They went after the IRGC command and control. That is a signal to Iran, not Iran territorially. I know where uh, Ambassador Bolton stands on that. Uh, we discussed that with him just yesterday. But they are, so far at least, not going to... Iran proper, but going to Iran as it's the IRGC, of course, is the military arm of the regime, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, uh, that Quds Force. And it is they who are helping train and arm the, uh, the proxies, of course, uh, the Houthis as well as Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, according to U.S. officials with whom we've spoken, they want to make it clear that this is directed against Iran, that they believe that Iran could stop their proxies. They don't uh, have clarity exactly that Iran is directing each strike, but they could stop them, clearly, and have not. But it's important that the regime itself has said they don't want a wider war. The U.S. does not want a wider war with Iran. The U.S., as you've pointed out, has a number of balancing uh, considerations here. They're walking a tightrope. They are indirectly negotiating with Hamas. Uh, and Iran, of course, as the sponsoring regime for the release of the hostages. Those negotiations are just now getting to an important stage, uh, not a critical stage because a lot of negotiations is yet to come. But there's a tightrope here as to not jeopardize the hostages. That is clearly a U.S. commitment. But uh, I think there's no hesitation in retaliating for the deaths of the three Americans. And if there was any delay, and there obviously has been a delay of several days, it was their determination to try, as they always do, to reduce uh, collateral damage, civilian casualties, to find the best targets, as well as waiting on weather conditions and satellite observance. And uh, as the former National Security Advisor, John Bolton, knows that full well. So there are a number of factors that, get, that come into play before they will actually take the strike. Um, I know that he and other critics have said that this would permit um, the, the bad guys to get away. They know what the targets are almost as much as we do. But I think that there was, there always is a consideration, unlike with other countries, to try to take a clean shot and reduce the possibility of wide-scale uh, civilian damage, which would become uh, an immediate propaganda victory for Iran and for their other allies. And uh, Andrea, Mr. before I let you go, can you, there, there had been so much focus prior to this moment when these three service members were killed on those diplomatic talks to try to get the hostages released. What is your latest reporting about where those talks stand? They think that they are promising, but that there are many, many steps to go. There was no thought that this was going to be immediate. You've already seen in the past week very strong disparaging comments, uh, seemingly obstructionist comments from Prime Minister Netanyahu. He has to play to the two very far-right ministers without whom he doesn't have a coalition government. But it is significant that the head of Mossad, David Barnea, the head of Shin Bet, and the IDF intelligence official, all three were, were represented in Paris at those talks. Also significantly, both Egypt and Qatar were there. Egypt, which has better relationships with the truly aggressive, most militant of the Hamas leaders who were inside Gaza and believed to be the orchestrators of October 7th. And the, and it's, you know, <laughs> you can't call them less radical, but more institutionalized, perhaps, political. Hamas leaders who were outside living in Doha, sheltered and sponsored by, uh, by Qatar. Now, it's very clear that Israel has long known about Qatar's sponsorship and subsidies to Hamas. It was a way to keep Gaza sort of under control, under, they thought, under their thumb. They completely misread that, missed what happened on October 7th. It's very deeply undermined the credibility of Netanyahu and his government, but still there's strong support in Israel for going after Hamas. Uh, and the question now is for how long and whether or not there is such significant pressure to get the hostages out that Netanyahu would 
make some conciliatory gestures. Mm -hmm. It's also important that a ceasefire uh, could be very, very helpful in calming the waters with some of these proxy groups. And the officials here are not taking what was said today by Hamas's political leader as the final answer. They think there's still a lot of running room, and it's important that the slightly differing positions of Egypt and Qatar were also reconciled in those talks in Paris so that they have a unified agreement, a text that has been signed uh, and sponsored by Qatar and the U.S. as well. And so now it's a question of the very tough negotiations to come on how many Palestinian fighters for hostages and to try to get those hostages out. Uh, the challenge will be getting it over the finish line. It just exactly. incredible. Thank you so much for joining us with all of your incredible reporting. Andrea Mitchell, thank you so much. Let me go to Ali Rafa now at the White House. Ali, what are you hearing from officials there? Obviously, this is an ongoing and evolving moment. And there is a lot of pressure on President Biden as he launches these retaliatory strikes. Yeah, Kristen, so far we haven't uh, seen any reaction from White House officials uh, or President Biden. We do expect uh, Vice President Kamala Harris to actually take the stage at a campaign event in South Carolina shortly. Uh, so we'll be monitoring any reactions she may have. Uh, but as you mentioned, Kristen, it really can't be underscored enough how tricky of a decision uh, it must have been for President Biden uh, to go forward with th this decision. We have reporting that uh, there were real concerns on his part over how this uh, retaliatory attack could potentially impact uh, the hostage deal between uh, the Qataris, Egyptians, Israelis, and of course U.S. officials in getting the rest of those hostages out of Hamas's hands in Gaza. Uh, the president uh, apparently being eased out of those concerns by his top aides and then uh, making this decision. And ever since he said uh, that he did, the world has really been waiting with bated breath on what what the next step would be, what that would look like, when it would happen, and where it would be. Uh, of course, we did expect these, uh, some of these attacks to be militarily in these places that we're seeing attack now, Iraq and Syria, places where these Iranian-backed uh, militia groups have weapons storehouses, also places where these Iranian-backed militia groups have also attacked U.S. service members. And that's really how we got to this place to begin with, because ever since the Israel-Hamas war, began on October 6th. Uh, remember, we have seen uh, over a hundred of these uh, attacks nearly daily uh, by these Iranian-backed groups on U.S. assets in the Red Sea, on U.S. service members. Officials have said that most of those strikes have been able to be intercepted uh, by the U.S. Uh, the injuries caused to U.S. service members have been minor, but early on, the president set a threshold, set a red line, and said that all of that would change and a more forced uh, response and retaliation would be necessary if U.S. service members were to end up being killed uh, in one of these attacks. And of course, now that we know that that did happen uh, last uh, Saturday night in Jordan uh, with three U.S. service members being killed, dozens more injured, uh, the president has gone ahead and made this decision uh, for, as U.S. officials have noted, is going to be a multi-phased uh, retaliation that could actually end up being several weeks long, Kristen. All right, Ali Rafa at the White House for us. Ali, thank you. And Ambassador Bolton is still here with us. Ambassador, I want to pick up on a point that Andrea made, which is the United States' relationship with Israel. As you know, President Biden is getting some pressure from within his own party to do more to pressure Israel to have a ceasefire. There are these very sensitive diplomatic talks happening right now that would essentially cease military operations and include a release of the hostages. How likely is it that we will see movement on those talks, given how complicated and complex they are? Well, I think it's very unlikely. I don't think yeah. you should, uh, not implying you are, but underestimate the pressure Biden is putting on Netanyahu, unprecedented in the U.S.-Israel relationship, I think, to break Netanyahu's resolve. And, and they may succeed at that. Uh, and, and everybody understands the humanitarian concern about the hostages. Uh, but I will put it very directly. Are the hostages more important than the cause of this conflict? Not whether there's a wider war, uh, not what happens in Gaza, but what is the fundamental cause that got this started? And the answer to that's Iran. Mm -hmm. If we don't deal with that 
cause today and people find Iran's behavior objectionable, how much more objectionable will it be when Iran gets nuclear weapons? So I think the administration is making a mistake by torquing two already very complicated situations into one, dealing with the biggest threat to peace and security in the Middle East, which is the government in Tehran, and the Arab-Israeli issue, which has been going on for 75 years without a solution. There's also, obviously, the discussions that are going on to get the hostages released. And then there's this broader diplomatic dance going on, if you will, to try to uh, strike a deal between Saudi Arabia and partners in the region. Um, those talks effectively fell apart after October 7th. We know that they have tried to resume those talks, and the goal, the broader goal there, is pressuring Iran, exactly as you're saying. And I've been talking to sources who are familiar with some of those talks. They say we haven't given up hope on the talks yet. But realistically speaking, how can that type of broad deal get done against this backdrop? Well, I think part of it would be facing up to the reality in the region. And I think many of the Gulf Arab states believe correctly that Iran is the basic problem here. I, I wish they could say that more publicly. What's happening, what began in Gaza, is not an Arab-Israeli war. It's not a Palestinian-Israeli war. It's an Iranian war against Israel. This is their ring of fire strategy. And I think given that the Gulf Arab states in particular appreciate that their strategic situation vis-a-vis -vis Iran is very close to Israel's. That's why these Abraham Accords have been facilitated. That's why the Saudis were in discussion. That strategic reality not only has not changed because of these hostilities, the underlying uh, convergence of interest has been proven by the hostilities. And Ambassador Bolton, I'm going to ask you to stand by one more time because I believe we have Kier Simmons from Iraq, uh, our chief foreign correspondent. Kier, if you are still with us, Bring us up to speed. What is the very latest uh, that you are seeing and hearing and that your reporting is telling you? Well, Kristen, uh, we're just hearing, and this is uh, these are reports in the region. So, uh, you know, you, 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 this isn't confirmed, but now that we know that there is uh, U.S. action, uh, I think we're a, a little more able to, con to report uh, when we hear... Um, that there have been uh, conflagrations in this region. So uh, we're hearing reports of explosions in Ambar province um, in uh, an area where uh, the uh, Islamic resistance in Iraq, some of those factions are based. Uh, so that wouldn't be a surprise if, if that was what was happening there. Uh, we're still not clear about whether the uh, what happened in eastern Syria that you and I talked about at the top of the show, whether that is, is connected to uh, this campaign now, it very well, very well may be. Uh, that strip in eastern Syria, again, is a place where there are Iranian-backed militia uh, camped, it, also a place where the Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, has a base, a, a base that is considered quite substantial. In, for example, reinforced tunnels to try to prevent uh, kind of bombing from... Uh, having an impact on, on their facilities there. So that, that again, that, that strip is, is in Syria, close to the Iraqi border. Um, an, another location that, um, you know, wouldn't be surprising if it was targeted. Um, what we don't know from that CENCOM statement, we know a lot about uh, the, the, the size and breadth of this um, campaign tonight. What we don't know is the actual targets. And I think that that will begin to emerge partly through these local reports. And, and of course, at some point, perhaps we'll be, we will be um, told. But some of the things that I'll be looking for there, Kristen, is uh, how much of it is here in uh, Iraq and how much of it is in Syria. Because um, we uh, know that uh, Iran is embedded in Syria in a way that even we didn't ha see, you know, perhaps five years ago, certainly not uh, a decade ago. And, and, and uh, to make a point about that, to underscore, I think as we hear about uh, the, the breadth of this campaign, uh, actually what it will do is put the focus on just how widespread Iranian influence and facilities are uh, in Syria and also in Iraq. Uh, exactly what I'm discussing with Ambassador Bolton throughout this hour. Keir Simmons, thank you so much. Please stay safe there, my friend. Ambassador Bolton, uh, we initially had you on to talk about a range of issues, including the fact that you have updated the forward in your book, The Room Where It Happened, in which you talk about your concerns, your 
intensified concerns about the threat from former President Trump if he were to be reelected. A moment like this puts those types of concerns into a new light. Well, I think this uh, kind of crisis situation that we're in now uh, is one where Donald Trump would not know how to perform. Uh, as I've said many times, I don't think he's fit to be president, but where it is most at risk for the United States, you can take whatever position you want on, on how to handle this conflict. I don't think he's up to it. Mm -hmm. I don't think he could stand the pressure, and he would not have a strategic sense of what America's vital interests are, and that could cost us dearly. Ambassador John Bolton, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your insights as we follow this breaking news. We really appreciate it. Thank you for staying for the hour. And we will be back on Monday with more Meet the Press Now. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press on your local NBC News station. I'll have an exclusive interview with Speaker of the House Mike Johnson to discuss these breaking developments, as well as the border deal and the looming vote to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas. And Steve Kornacki will join me with the results of a brand new NBC News poll. You do not want to miss it. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.